Today, Lord, we thank you for the servants, children of God, those that have come to serve, to serve you and to serve their generation. Lord, we bless you. We thank you. We worship you, Father. Now we pray, Father, Lord, for you to come and speak to us, Lord. Speak your word that we may live. Lord, we need you. We need the strength. We need to not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, you said. And so, Lord, today we need your word. We need your word because your word can set us free. Amen. Your word can heal us. Your word can deliver us. Your word can provide for us. Your word can strengthen us. Your word can encourage us. I thank you for your word. I need your word. Amen. I will not be ignorant. I will not be unlearned. I will not be stubborn. I will not be self-willed. And I will not ask you for your word. Amen. Because I cannot live without your word. Amen. Not in a way that would please you. In a way that would glorify your name. In a way that would give me hope. That would give me peace in my heart. That come that day, I shall see you face to face. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank I love you. Lord. And the people of God love you. And we say thank you. Yes. And we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <coughs> bless the Lord. Oh, I just love it when God comes and visits us. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> just nothing like it. You know, I just know, who am I? <laughs> who am I? I am so unworthy. But I just do as he asks, and that's all I can do. So I'm so thankful that we can just do what God has called us to do and know this, that Jesus is pleased, Amen. that God is pleased. Amen. And so today, I would like to embark upon a little bit of a thought that we had begun to explore in the last couple of services. A couple of services ago, we talked about uh, the greatest thing that we can do in our maturity is to love. Right? Our Father, God, is love. And He has called us to love Him with all our heart, mind, soul, strength, right? And the second commandment, likewise, is what? To love our neighbor. That's ourself. Because I submit to you, you cannot prove that you love God unless you love your neighbor. Isn't that good? So we, we love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and we love our neighbor as ourself, and in doing so, we fulfill the royal law. We fulfill the very thing that Jesus said that we need to do. Because that, in the end, is what it's all about. It is not about what this generation, what this time, what this life can give to me. It's about what can I do for it. Man, man is not saved by works, but without works, man shall not stand and say, here, well done, my good and faithful servant. And those are the words of Jesus. Mm-hmm. This life is given to us to enjoy God, but also to demonstrate how much we love God and appreciate God. It is not a grievous thing for me to bless somebody in the name of the Lord and to give up myself, my time, my talent, my substance to help them. It's not a grievous thing at all. Because it is a demonstration of that which is birthed in me by the Spirit of God. My new creation. I'm no longer the same. I am not the same selfish person I was 25 years ago. I'm the son of God. I was a child of God, but I believe I've grown a little bit. I'm no longer a little toddler. And if, y'all, if you guys think I'm still a little toddler, you need to run. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We can't afford to be listening to the blind that we're blind to a ditch. We need to listen to those that have become mature to full age, that have a proper perspective and orientation to this life and to living. And so we serve our generation. If service is not included in our terminology and our, our worship, then we need to reevaluate because I don't want to be one of those that just loves in word only Amen. and not in deed. We need to love in word and in deed. So the expression of our life as we grow in the kingdom is all about letting God's will be done in our life, letting his love flow, letting his life Begin to affect a change in the world in which we live. You know, God is not out there performing miracles by himself for the sake of just performing miracles. He is moving in the hearts of his men and women, his children, to pray and to be there to present himself to others. Ephesians says it's according to the power that worketh in us. God's power is at work in us. And he's using man. No one comes to the Lord except they hear the gospel. And how beautiful are the feet of the, are those 
that preach the gospel. And we know that we've all been given a straight mission to preach the gospel. The good news. It's not bad news. It's not shaman news. It's not, it's not just empty, trivial news. It's not just something that can be taken lightly. It's very good news. That God can heal me. God can set me free. God can bring me into an abundance of life. Jesus said that. I came to bring life and life more abundantly. So it's very good news, but our problem is sometimes we don't know how to share that news. And so we're growing in our faith. We're growing in our ability to say, God, it ain't about the eloquence of what I'm about to say. It's about me being able to just say, you know, the Lord Jesus loves you. He gave his life for you. He laid it down. Said it isn't worthy of me trying to get my own agenda done because I want people to know how much I care. And I care for them. And so the Lord loves us with all of his heart. And he helps us to learn how to follow in those steps. To, to not love our lives so much that we can't risk, take a chance of sharing our love. And so God is so good. He, he helps us to grow. Now Wednesday was a very somber word. You know, I think a couple Sundays ago was a very good word. You know, it was a very enlightening, encouraging word. That, you know, in our maturity... You know, a couple Sundays ago, whatever. Um, you know, that, that, that demonstration of maturity in my life is my example of love. So as I'm exampling love, you can see that the maturity has happened. And also myself, I see as I'm walking in love and serving my generation, I can see that maturity level as well. I don't have to think I'm just a, a nobody, a nothing, a little child, a little limpet. I know better than that. I've grown. I don't need milk anymore. Milk is the, the, you know, when we're vain, we're supposed to desire the silver, sincere milk of the word that we might grow. Why well, don't mean anymore? I need meat. And meat is, guess what? Meat is me being to apply the word. I know the Lord saying, do something, and I'll take that very principle and I'll apply it. So I don't, I don't need milk just to live. I need meat now. And so meat is good. That's Hebrews chapter 4. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the world. But meat belonging to them that are full age, mature. They have the ability to serve both good and evil, don't they? They know how to do, you know. That's what it's all about. In our maturing, we want to be an example of Christ in this earth. Example of his love. And so that's an outward doing. And so we found out that this Wednesday, which was a sombering word, there is a peril or a danger to having an empty heart. To removing from us the, should I say burden? Removing from us obligation, the acknowledgement of the responsibility, that's the word. When we remove, try to dismiss the charge that the Lord has given us to go and make disciples of all nations to all of us, when we remove that, you have a danger of having an empty heart. And the Lord warned us of that. That that's not a good place to be because you are vulnerable to not only past ways of living, getting entertained and consumed by things that used to consume me when I was a child, but also increased worse living, increased evil desire, increased activity that doesn't become me as a child. Right? Instead, I'll take some other spirit for himself and come back. So there's a danger to have an emptiness of heart. So, you know, salvation is not just a free ride into heaven. If you die once you first get saved, okay, praise God. You know, you're like a thief on the cross. You're going to be with Jesus in his kingdom, yes. But if you live here, you have choices every day. Many have walked in here naked today and thank God. Everybody say, thank God. Turn your hands and say, thank God. Amen? You all took some choices. Of what am I going to put on? I'm going to put some garments on so that I come into the house of God and I'm presentable. And don't you know that's the same way it is in the kingdom of God? Each and every day we wake up, we are going to put on the garments of God that we might be presentable. And this is such a good word for the Lord Jesus this morning. This is like absolutely blown me away. This is the Holy Spirit. We need to be clothed with the proper attire so that we be not ashamed. And the scripture speaks of our attire being the white linen. The fine white linen. 
And for those of us that need a scripture reference, just turn your Bibles very quickly before I get into the passage for the day. Turn to Revelation chapter 19. A couple of verses here, verse 8 and verse 14, that will bear that out for you. And this is cool. I never do even know where we tie all this together. My mind has been going a bunch of different places, and I'm like, okay, God, I just got to follow you because I don't know where we're going. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I woke up, I put clothes on today. You know, we come to church and we'll put some clothes on today. We leave this place, you're going to have some clothes on. And tomorrow, you better put your clothes back on. In the spirit. You know what I'm saying? You follow me? So, Revelation chapter 19. Who's got that wants to read verse 8 for us very quickly? Read it nice and loud. Hey, are we recording this? Who wants to who wants to read it real loud? goes by the blood of the Lamb, but each and every day I must find an obedience to the prompting, the choices of the Spirit, so that I can continue to wear the proper garment. To choose the wrong choices means I'm taking the garment off and I may be a little bit ashamed. Go to Matthew chapter 22 real quick. I don't want to be found without the proud garden. I don't think you do either. In Matthew chapter 22, you know, Jesus gave us a parable here. And I'm going to maybe not read the entire thing so that we can make sure we use our time wisely. But I want to pull some important things out of here. But this is not the main lesson today. This is building our lesson, which is good. Verse 2 says that the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said, is like to a certain king which made a marriage for his son. Who would be that king? Our heavenly father. And who was that son? The Lord Jesus. Amen? And so, the kingdom of heaven is like that. The Father making a marriage for the, for the Lord Jesus Christ, His Son. 
And he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. And again, he sent forth other servants, telling them which are bidden. Behold, I prepared my dinner, and my oxen, my fountains are chilled, and all things are ready to come unto the marriage. But they made light of it. They went the ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took the rest of his servants and treated them, and treated them spitefully and slew them. When the king was heard of this, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies, and he destroyed those murderers, and he burned up their city. Then he saith to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden are not worthy. Now, who has he spoken of? He has spoken of his love and his pouring out of his life and his promises to the children of Israel. And prior to Christ, God had chosen to manifest himself. Through the children of Israel. And they were to be the examples and servants that would show forth who God was. They were to be the ones that would come to the wedding. But they would not listen to the prophets. They stoned and they killed them. To the degree that they stoned and they killed Jesus. Come on. God's people. God's people shamefully treated the servants of God, prophets, teachers. And they, they discounted and belittled and disrespected the fact that they were called to the marriage supper. And so God said, we're going to do away with that. And he did. The veil was rent. And two, from top to bottom. Think about it. For those of you that haven't allowed a little revelation knowledge to hit you for a little while, it was not torn from the bottom up. To tear something, you have to go ahead and apply force, right? It was rent from the top to the bottom, signifying that was torn of God. It was not torn by any man. Part of it. You understand what I'm saying? God had done away with the old way of established the new way. Why? Because he was very, what did Jesus say? These are not my words. He was very, the king did. He was very wroth. <laughs> he was wroth. And he destroyed the murderers and he burned up their city. In verse 8 he said, he saith to his servants now, the wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find, bid them to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and they gathered together as many as they found, both bad and good. Isn't that amazing, you know? You don't got to get your life right. You ever become Jesus? You just don't. You come just as you are. You come with all your baggage. He takes care of us. Thank you, Lord. It's not about trying to figure out whether or not you're good enough. Sorry, none of us are good enough. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said, Brother you know, Friend, how camest thou hither not having on a wedding garment? In the peril of humanity. He was speechless. He didn't have a word to say. Don't be one of God's children without something to say. You store up and you treasure the word of God in your heart that you may have an answer whole to give to somebody when they ask you. We're to be ready always in season and out preaching the word. The living word, the rhema that comes to give you joy and hope. It's the same word that can give joy and hope and deliverance to somebody else. Don't you be speechless. But this man was speechless. And you and I don't have to be speechless. So in verse 13, the king said to his servants, Bind him, have him, but take him away and cast him in outer darkness, for there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Wow. Isn't that awesome to see the context 
of that verse. For many are called, but few are chosen. Jesus laid down His life a ransom for many. And all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But make no mistakes, folks. If you don't go home to be with Jesus, pretty darn quick, right thereafter, you've got choices to make every day that's going to make you a part of the choosing process. You go to the end of your days without doing and being obedient to the Holy Spirit, I guarantee you, you will not be chosen. You were saved, yes. But when it comes down to the very bottom of the line, when he judges the righteous acts of the saints to find out whether you've got a wedding garment or not, you'll find out that you're not standing up to the Master's standards. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Again, another scripture out of the New Testament. It is not optional. It is the way it is, because it is God in His kingdom. He desires for us to represent Him. God is holy. Cannot represent Him if we are not holy. Amen? So we walk in holiness. And so, this poor man, he found he did not have a wedding garment on. And it took him out. He was no longer associated part of the children of God, a part of the bride, a part of what God's plan for man was. He was removed. There's a lot that may want to come in because it sounds so appealing. We go, we worship, man, to get up there and, and we, we have a good time. It's enjoyable. Sometimes we even feel good. But then there comes times, you know, that when the preacher's preaching, yeah, I don't really want to care text going on, Facebook real quick, oh, somebody like that, oh, right. that's just in the house of God, let alone the way you live your life, living your life, you don't even give consideration to the things that God is saying to you throughout the day, so therefore, your righteousness, your, your, your clothes, your fine linen, it's not on you, maybe beside you or in your drawer or somewhere, and you're going, oh, I did not isn't that what Adam and Eve did? Their eyes were open. They went running for shelter. They had to find something to cover them up. Some leaves. Must have been some big leaves back that way. <laughs> you can see these little leaves. I'll try to give you these little leaves. Everything was big back then. You see the next ones? They were big. It's a big plant. So praise the Lord. We don't want to go through our day without the clothing. So now as we get ready to turn the page and and kind of evaluate something that God would want to encourage our hearts with today. Turn with me over to Luke chapter 15. I'm going to read a couple things out of chapter 15 and 16 before we close. It's important each and every day we put our clothing on. If we don't, I think the, the officers might deliver us to the judge, and the judge might deliver us to the president. You know, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I think there might be a price to pay. So we want to put on our clothing, especially in the spirit. I'll tell you another thing. This is just for those of us that are doing pretty good in the spirit. No. It's important to know this, that those that are walking very intimately with Christ, they know who is it. You can't pull the wool over their eyes, you know what I'm saying? They kind of know what's going on. It doesn't mean that they boast it all off somewhere you're not. It's just they know. They know who's paying the price, who's not paying the price, and so we pray. We pray for those that are, are in a place of being distracted, disillusioned, maybe hurt, wounded. Those that are somebody know who's anybody. But we never, Lord, we see mothers hurt ourselves. We never, Lord, that fact that we know. But I think that's an important, important point because I think sometimes for those of us that are on the other side of the point, we think we can hide. <laughs> Nobody knows. Trust me. Hold on. Nobody knows I'm hurt right now. Nobody knows I'm wounded. Nobody knows I'm insecure. Nobody knows it. Uh, trust me. We know. We just don't have to say it. We don't have to treat you accordingly. Ain't that a cool thing? Pray for you. You have a heart and passion. Because we want you strengthened like we are. 
Because those that stand take heed lest they fall. We pray for one another. That's the love of God in operation. Even when it's in obscurity. Might not be the great things I'm doing on the street corner. It says, hey, look at me. I got faith right now. Faith move them out. Because if our prayers are before men, Jesus is a measure of reward. He said, do your stuff in prayer closet, didn't he? Do it in secret where your father sees and you'll be rewarded. And I'll tell you what, those of us that are walking with God many times, it's a price that you never know how much work a person's getting done. But you get a ton done because you're praying for people and you're considering them and you're having mercy even when nobody else knows it. Don't give up, church. Don't give up with your clothes on. Be a person of prayer. Be a person that's considering the, the shortcomings and the hurts and the afflictions of another. It's never about how good can I make it through this and I guess a passage will probably show us that. Here in Luke chapter 14, actually 15, I'm sorry. Luke chapter 15, the very first part of this, we alluded to it probably two weeks ago. And I want to use it to set the backdrop for the point that I believe God would like to make to it. In chapter 15, he says in the top of the chapter, That what man among you, in verse 4, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine and go into the wilderness. Go after that which is lost until he find it. Gotta kind of consider that picture for a moment. No sheep would be. Now let's just think about the spielers. They had quite a few sheep. <laughs> they had to have a big 13 passenger van just to get them all in there. And sometimes, you know, they would go out to eat. <coughs> Some of the kids wouldn't make it back in a van. And they would leave thinking they had everybody. Some of the family was left behind. And by the time they would realize that, do you think they would go back and get them? Obviously, yes. Why? Because they were very precious. They were their children. And so are the sheep of this pasture, God's pasture. There is people. If one of them goes astray, don't think his heart ain't going to go get this one. I got to go out here and rescue them. I don't want them to get destroyed by the devourer. Right? So, this parable, we see God saying, Come on, you can understand this. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep in your fold, if one goes astray? It's not going to leave that fold to go after that one that's astray. They are valuable to you. Amen. They're precious. And you're going to leave them all. I know I'm going to leave those behind. They're going to be okay, Lord. I'm going to go over here. And I'm going to find this one that's lost. Because they may not make it. They may not see what's coming around the corner and the devil, the wolf. The pitfalls of life. Traps. All kinds of them out there, isn't it? Financial traps. Making wrong choices, wrong investments. Yeah, it can hurt. Take many, many years to get out of it. You know what I'm talking about. That's why you got your guard way up. Why you just purchase your life your house and cars? Be careful what you invest in. Otherwise, you just lose it. Lose that money. Let's go. Amen. So, you know, even though my business buys my car, I buy a nice car as well. Because I can get rid of it. If I buy me something that's not very nice, I might not be able to get rid of it. So if I have my car for six months, a year, or three years, it doesn't matter. It's up to the Lord, whatever He wants. But I know because I'm a good steward, which is the top part of chapter 16, to be a good steward. I know because I'm a good steward, God can trust more to me. So what's finished is up verse 5. He says, When that man had left his fold, his flock, to go and retrieve that lost sheep, when he found it, he lays it on his shoulders and he comes, comes back rejoicing. I thought that's some good preaching right there to think, to think about. I mean, he didn't sit there and get the whip out. You bad sheep. <laughs> Drive that baby back home. <laughs> you know, I said, get the stick. I said, this way. You know what I'm saying? Some of us in our anger, come on. Some of us get frustrated with brothers and sisters and we want to get like that. What are you doing? You know what I'm saying? We're flexing our muscles and we're giving our attitude and we're kicking. No! We're supposed to take that sheep and put it right upon our shoulders. You know? I don't know about you, but I know how I am with my legs. 
and very affectionate. He would be on my shoulder, and he, you know, and say, I can puzzle it. Give me a kiss. Give me a kiss. <laughs> that's me. That's what I'd be doing. <laughs> And that's what we see that the Father's love is. He wants to run right out there, and He wants to retrieve them that are lost. And so then He comes back, and He says to everyone around, He says, hey, I found my sheep which was lost. Rejoice with me. I found my sheep. And because everybody knows the value of that man's flock and his ability to, to retrieve that which is lost, of course, like, yes, I'm so glad for you. Rejoicing with them that rejoice is such an important point. It's such an important part of the kingdom. We are never to not rejoice with them that rejoice. Amen. Nor weep with them that weep. A lot of us like to do, oh yeah, it's time to weep because this person's weeping, but none of us can get up off of our to rejoice with those that are rejoicing. Why? Because I'm a little disappointed where I'm at. I don't know what I want. Blah, 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 blah. It's like, come on, get your eyes off yourself and get it on the body of Christ and the people that need to be saved and pray for them and have mercy and you'll be able to rejoice with others when they rejoice because you ain't worried about yourself. You're like, man, God just blessed you. Praise God. Yeah, it's so cool. Amen. Because a lot of times that empowerment of that testimony I can use to share my faith. Man, my brother, he was a struggle, but God came in, set him free. Next thing you know, he's leaving people in curse. He's like, man, you should know this guy. This guy is so cool. He's challenged me. I'm encouraged in the spirit by this guy. You know what I'm saying? But what's the insecurity? What's those that can't rejoice with those that rejoice? You just bottle right up, shut it all down. The power of that testimony is no longer going to flow out of their life. Think about it, guys. Think about it. Words. Power of life and death is in the tongue. We have to have a heart that can receive what's going on around us so everything can be used for the edification, a building. If I'm shut down in security looking at what people are thinking about me, guess what? Ain't going to be a whole lot coming out of me. It just won't. You've got to deal with this inner man. You've got to kill that old man. That the new man can live. And so obviously, when we liken this here to, to the kingdom of God, verse 7 says, Likewise, Joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repents. More than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. So amen. All of heaven is rejoicing when we, when we find ourselves choosing to clothe ourselves with obedience to the Spirit so that my fine linen is on and I'm looking a lot like the Father and the love of God is flowing and the Father ain't all staunch. He gave you a pretty nice place to live. It's a beautiful place. All of creation is just glorious. It's just wonderful to behold. All the beauty of this place. So don't think God didn't give you his best. He sure did. Okay. So that's why we go out and give people our best. I ain't trying to withhold nothing. And if they can go farther and faster than me, praise God. Yeah. So let's turn over to chapter 16. So if you were interested in that passage, it's right on the top of the the uh, chapter there talks about the unjust steward, dishonest steward here. But it's a pretty good point that it makes out of there. He went out and he built bridges. He was dismissing portions of the bill so others would, hey, hey, if you do me a favor, okay, cool. <laughs> the Lord commended the unjust steward, the dishonest, the dishonest steward. He said, because, you know, sometimes. The world is wiser than the children of life. This man had the principle in place that, you know what, we need to build bridges. We need to build bridges into people's lives. It isn't about I'm a child of God and you're not, and there's where it stands. No way. I need to find a way to connect my life, appreciate you in certain ways that you know I appreciate you, so we can be joined together when God calls us. No man comes to the Lord except the Lord draw. You've got to have a bridge, though, for a person to meet you. You've got to be able to present. You've got to be able to listen. You've got to be able to pray. You've got to be able to enjoy this meeting place together. That ain't going to happen if you're just a child of God and they're just a sinner. And that's the way you treat them. That's not the value that we just read. How when one sheep goes astray, God said, I'm leaving the 99 to go after this one's astray. I'm building me a bridge somehow, some way. And that's what the fine linen is, guys. You want to boil it down? No, don't think about it all as righteous. Oh, did I tithe right? Did I 
give right, you know, or of my time? Did I talk to this person right? Did I, we equate it to our natural acts. No, no, no. It's about where the heart of people and am I responding? There is no greater call. There's no greater joy. So much. You want to boil it all down. A lot of this is all peripheral. Man, when in a person for Christ is where the party's at. Yeah. That's where it's at. And it's like sometimes we get really, really content with all these other thrill things going on around because, yeah, God's in it. It's exciting. You know, we get encouraged. We get strengthened. We go out and do our thing again. But the real party, the real joy, is when somebody's coming back and they're lost. When somebody's there receiving them back with the love of Father, and bam, there's a party happening. So now later in this chapter, though, I want to read this because this is where the Lord kind of challenged my heart this week. And, and it is a challenge. I believe it's a challenge to the to the sinner, to the saint. Paul. Starting in verse 19, we'll look at this. There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And a lot of us know this story, this parable. But today, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and ate pretty darn good every day. I don't know about you, but I ain't a poor beggar. I'm doing pretty good in Christ because he blessed me with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus in heavenly places. I've been blessed by the riches of his grace, and I am not in want for anything right now, bless the Lord. Don't mean it couldn't turn around my mouth. But God's favor, his grace, and his blessing, I'm telling you, there's many a rich men today in the kingdom. That are dressed in purple. Royalty. How many are kings and priests under our God today? I am. Because my scripture shows me that I am. I'm a king and priest under my God. And I'm wearing some fine linen. The righteous acts of the saints. That begins to put a different spin on this than the way you've ever looked at it before, doesn't it? i got to take my religious cap off. The way I always process this is I've heard preachers preach it so many times. And I gotta start to think about what the Lord's saying to me now. Because there's some rich men that we pretty dark all well. They got that fine linen on. Okay, Lord, you got my attention. What do you say? Now, I don't want you, I don't like singing the same old songs like hymns because sometimes I get robbed of the, the value of the scripture. I get robbed of the revelation knowledge that it's speaking of because I just get caught with the melody. I just sing the melody. And so the, the impact of the words are gone. And that's what I'm trying to say to you today. But him that hath an ear, hear. So there was rich men, which clothed in purple, fine linen, very sumptuously every day. At the same time, there was also a beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, full of sores. You know, the thing about being laid at his gate means the rich man had to cross his path every time he came and he went from his place of abode. When we're going in our life to and fro, we're constantly coming into contact with people that need Jesus. They need help. Don't you be that rich man that can't even give him a little bread from him. What is that bread from? Man shall not live by bread, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. If you can't tell him one word of hope, you are pathetic. And I'm saying it to myself. Do you understand what I'm saying? I don't want to leave this place the same way I came in. I want to leave this place changed. I want to see people for who they are. They are the sheep that he'll leave the 99, the entire church for, and go out and make sure that he brings them home before they're destroyed. But if I can't even give them a breadcrumb, if I can't even give them a word from God, they have no hope. I had the pleasure of meeting a neighbor this, this weekend here. Corey's neighbor, Phil, across the street. And it was a beautiful blessing. He'll testify of, of probably, you know, the significance of really what happened. But I just want to say this. As I got a chance to meet the man, he had said something to us. Because he was saying that he's not a believer in Christ. But he said he was a part of the Catholic Church. For many years, he's growing Catholic. 
And he said something that just pricked me in my soul that I can't get rid of. He said, yeah, me and my family, we went there, and it's, you know, we did what we were supposed to do. You know, we thought that's what it was all about. He says, but nobody ever told me about Christ. He says, nobody ever told me. And I was like, wow. Guys, that's where it hit me. That's where it hit me. People are going and they're trying to do what they know to do. And we that got the answers, we can't even give them a break from. And he went for years. And the people within the Catholic Church wouldn't even talk about Christ. Believers that was in his life didn't even talk about Christ. He looked across the street from a godly man. Then eventually he said 10 years later, didn't he? He said 10 years later, the man told me that in a men's meeting, I put your name up on a prayer board so we could be able to pray for you. But you know what that shares with me? Not that it's a discredit that he didn't, you know, take the time to bring him up a prayer. But where was the neighbor talking to him? Why didn't the neighbor talk to him and tell him? Because I'll tell you what, he's like many of us. We don't care. We don't give people the bread of God, the bread of life, the words that bring hope, the good news. And what's it all about if we can't do that? We're just, we got the glory, we got the joy, we're just feeling good. But I'm telling you why God's showing you the value and the leave the 99 for the one because there's going to be a party in heaven when this person repents. And they say, God, I didn't know you loved me like that. That's what repentance means. Not a debasing and humiliating of themselves, but acknowledging that they didn't know the right way. But they do now, and they're willing to walk it out. They're willing to come that way. Amen? That's what repentance means. It isn't a discredit, a humiliation, or nothing. My God, God forbid if any one of us ever looked at somebody that repented in God's day time. Whoa! I recall we all had a at one point in time. Go to require your salvation, you'd be found a sinner. If you weren't a sinner, then you're in his. That's right. So, beggar was outside of the gate. Every day, his desire. The world, you know, they see us and they walk by and they got their salads and, and they got their, their impressions of us. You gonna let it be true? You gonna let their impression be true? Or are we gonna find a way to break us? You know, hey! And that's the worst one. You, you know what I'm saying? That takes you by surprise a little bit. You know, what's you know what I'm saying? You don't get too close to me, you know what I'm saying? I don't know where you are. <laughs> but hey, hey, good to meet you. I wanna let you know, you know, I see you every now and then. You know, my name's Hey. And just you ever see, you know, you ever meet anything, let me know, you know. Oh, wait a second. Oh, that's cool. Oh, you know, I see here too. Why is that? Well, oh, because I, I live right over there. Or I go to church over here. Or, you know, I, I work over here. Oh, that's cool. And the bridge starts to build. The bridge starts to build. And you've got to build it. And you just can't build it with no information. You can't build it with nothing to offer. You gotta build that bridge. You know why you build that bridge? Because they, they that are maturing know this. I gotta love God and love my neighbor with all my heart. And to love them ain't about what I can do with them without being able to share the greatest thing of all, and that is the good news. That the Lord Jesus has paid the price already. It's a done deal. It's over. You don't gotta earn your way in, you don't gotta clean yourself up. All you gotta do is say, Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And then begin to follow him. So all Jesus ever asks, come, follow me. Did he ever ask any more from humanity? I challenge you to find him where he did. He said, come, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And so, Lazarus begged, and we see that even the dogs, they came and they licked his sores, because he, he was a person of it, suffering. He was a person of problems, you know. And, and, and the dogs licking sores, just the enemy torment. Just me torment as humanity is. They got the crime. You know, they got the, they got the drama. They got the sin. They got it all going on all around them and they can't understand why sometimes, you know, life is a little rough. Well, the dogs would come and they'd lick the sores and open the wounds and, you know, it, it just made it extremely difficult. And it came to pass that when the beggar died, there was no one to bury him. There was no place 
for him to be honored when he left. My Bible just tells me Jesus said this. He was carried away by the angels into Abraham's bosom. There was no honor in it. He just gave up the ghost. What they do with this body, who knows? Dump it in the dump, drop it in the ocean, burn it in the incinerator, whatever. Who knows? How can I say that? Because I see when the rich man died also, and we all die. <laughs> Amen. No man's gonna smile. He was there. The rich man had people take note. Oh, here was a rich man. Here was a child of God. He, he had fine purple on. He fared sumptuously. He built for himself quite a lot. And they buried him and paid their last respects. But verse 23 says, and in hell, he looked up. And it's a little late for a reality check. That's just a little late for a reality check. Mm -hmm. Now again, we like to look at this as uh, somebody outside of us. <laughs> but I'm telling you today, guys, I just read for you a scripture over Matthew chapter 22. Friend, how did you get in here without God? How did you get in here without your clothes on? Are you willing to hear the Spirit? Or are we going to be like the Pharisees that he rebuked just before this? He said, you always justify yourselves. I'm not here to justify myself today. If the shoe fits... I'll wear it. I don't want to be guilty of passing by those in need every day, especially the greatest need of just coming to know the Lord Jesus because he can change everything according to his riches and glory. Amen? He's the giver of every good gift. He is the provider, Jehovah Jireh. We shall never go for a want because he cares and he loves and he takes care of all of our needs according to his riches and glory. He will be our sustainer and they need the one that has the keys to life. So I'll be that person that gives the word, that gives the helping hand, that I not be found where this rich man found himself, separated from God because he did not have his garment on. He would not walk through life recognizing it's not about the blessing and how well I can eat and everything that's going on in my life, but what am I doing for others? Am I responding? Am I being obedient? Am I helping build that bridge? Am I giving bread? What am I doing? Amen? If you're here for any length of time, it's not about you and sweet Jesus just going to get by because you're saved. No. He's going to look at whether or not you've got your garment on. These are all Jesus' teachings this morning. Amen. All right. So we're getting ready to wrap this up. You know the rest of the story? He cried out, and his father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime reserved, receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between it, us, and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. He said, I, uh, the rich man, he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear him, them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Now I think it interesting because Jesus was just about to lay down his life, and he's the one that shared this parable. He was already, he was already ready for the fact that when he rose again, people still would not listen, though one rose from the dead. They will not listen. Can somebody grab the back of please? He was already prepared for the reality that you and I entertain. With sheer, it seems that they don't want nothing to do with it. He was already well aware that there would be rejection 
even though he rose from the dead. And so today, I would challenge us not to use the exceptions to justify our lack of obedience or faith. Don't allow people and their, their, their rejecting of Christ to stop you from doing what you need to do, which is to be a representative of God's love, to be a light to this world, to do what he's asked you to do. Because otherwise you say no to the Holy Spirit. Let's break that down. Don't say no to the Holy Ghost just because you know people are hard and they won't hear it. Jesus knows that. Let's press through and give them the bread of life as we can. The message of God, the words of God, the word of hope as God leads us. I think it's very ironic if you'll turn with me to John chapter 11. That he said those words. And here we see in John chapter 11. Where Jesus' friend, verse 14, you see it? In John chapter 11, verse 14, that his friend Lazarus, that he had died. But Jesus didn't give up on him. Even though Lazarus had died, he knew it was an opportunity for him to make the final trump point. He may have shared about it, the rich man and Lazarus. He may have said they ain't going to listen even though they bring him back from the dead. But it didn't stop him from making his final point. When he finally came after four days and they had buried him and he was gone, huh, in his tomb, amen? He finally came because he knew it would be for the sakes that the glory of God could be revealed. You see that in verse 25, Martha had come up to him and she says, oh, let's just look at the context. Verse 21, if you had been here, my brother had not died. Verse 22, but I know now even but whoever thou will ask of God. God will give it to you. And Jesus said unto her, Five brothers shall rise again. And Martha's like, Fine with that. I know he's going to rise at the last resurrection. She's not comprehending in about 30 seconds from now, maybe about two minutes from now, he's going to be here. That's not even entering her heart. It's not even entering into a way of thinking. He said, Wait, I'm here. Brothers shall rise. Well, I know that because the last day, at the last resurrection, he's going to rise. What did Jesus say in verse 25? He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, he shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. As long as you're still living, don't stop believing. Jesus has called you to share his hope, his good news. Believe all this? She said, Dear Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had said so, she went her way and called Mary her sister. So now Jesus proceeds to go to the tomb. And he finds a bunch of folks caring for a person they love very greatly. Lazarus was a man that made an impact. He was a good brother, he was a good friend. He was obviously somebody that was sorely missed. And they were all Greek. And Jesus so loves man. He can so identify with the way that we feel. That he himself loved. Our God is able to be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, our weaknesses, our hurts. Don't you think today that I've been hurt too bad that God can't take care of? Me? That I've got something going on in my life, there's no way God can deal with this. Don't you think that way? Because Jesus wept. He can identify with where you're suffering. He can take care of you. He can bind the broken heart. He can heal the wounds. But you've got to be willing to let him do it. 
Don't push him away. So obviously we know that Jesus said, come forth. Lazarus, come forth. And there shall be nothing greater than his word. There shall be nothing to stop the power of his word. And those, those stones, when they rolled them away, gave entrance for Lazarus to begin to walk again. Now obviously he was bound in great cross. So maybe it wasn't a real dignified kind of walk. You know what I'm saying? Looking out the tomb, you know, and you're going to see this. Come on. the man coming back and he's going to freak out. He's out there in the party with, you know, Bob Ray you know, all the guys that had some time, you know, they were No, he's all about the You know what I'm saying? He's out there the door. But what's important, what is the very next thing that Jesus said? You get your Bibles? Lose them! Lose them! Anybody that comes to Jesus gets set free! He will not leave you bound! The very first words out of his mouth when he brings you to life is loose him! That's why we live in a boat. I lived in a boat for a few months and I know you did too. If you had two experience with the Lord Jesus Christ, you had a little boat you lived in for about three months. Nothing could go wrong. It don't matter if you got an answer to me. Nothing's going wrong today. I love Jesus and he loves me and you're a bum. Because he said, oops, all that stuff that was on your life that bound you up, gone. Has no power. And I'm just like, you're wild. And we got to do the walk at home too. Amen. So, Jesus demonstrated that even though they won't listen to one that comes back from the dead, he ain't leaving you in the grave. He's calling forth. He's calling us forth today, church, to be a people that are dressed in the fine linen. He's calling us to go out and make a difference. He's calling us to not be as that rich man that just lives sumptuously every day. Farewell. Oh my gosh, no. No, this is the last days. This is the last hours. We have to have a heart for God's people that are not yet his children. We have to have a heart for his creation that he created, that he's longing for. He's waiting patiently for the precious fruit of the earth. And that don't mean he's waiting for an apple to pop off the tree. He's waiting for those that have not come to know him yet to be able to say, I did not know, but now I know. Praise God. I have come to a place I see now. I was blind, but now I see. We've got to be there for people to get there. How great was it when we ourselves said it? I was blind. Boy, was I blind. But I can see. We need to be there for others to be able to get that same place. Get that same revelation. Oh my gosh, I can see now. Praise God. If we don't walk away from this place with that in our heart, then we're just coming to church. I don't know about you. I didn't come to church today. I came to visit with the king. I came to let the king change my life. To give me hope again in my heart that I might see others come to know him. Because it may not be very long. We say, even so come. Why? Because I believe it's probably about time. Even so come. So let's be a people of faith. Share God's word. Let's not walk by the same people every day that you know are sitting at your gate. Whether it's on the job, whether it's you know, where you live with your neighbors, whether it's in life. You know who you see every day, that gas station attendant that you always go and buy your stuff from, where Steve, you know, he shared that testimony. I mean, you know. I mean, sure that you did, but the people, you know when God has put your path across other people, be quick to give words of hope. Amen? Amen. Let's rise to our feet and pray. Father, we thank you today, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that we will not just be like the Pharisees and we just make excuses and justify our lives, Lord. Father, if the shoe fits, we shall wear it. Why? Because we can get free of those things where complacency and apathy brings us, where hurt can take us, where being bound up with different stuff in our life, where it can rob us from being able to wear the clothes that you've ordained for us to put on. Lord, the white linen is something you've ordained for us to put on, to walk with you. I didn't even go into Revelation chapter 3, but you said there were few that were in Sardis that were worthy to walk with you because they had not defiled their garments. Lord, we don't want to be of an empty heart or an empty mind with the peril, the danger of, of slipping back into old ways, but we want to be a people, Lord, that every day we live and we move, we have our being in you, we respond to the prompting of the Holy Spirit to do the good things, to give life, to give hope. 
Lord, to give people an understanding that we love them. Not just Jesus, you love them, but Lord, we love them too. I think that's not more on this day. But Lord, it is true. I believe it's true, Lord. We can love them. We're not selfish. We don't have to be self-centered. Lord, we can let people live because they hear your words, because we'll be faithful to give you words. And so, Lord, let us not be the, the piece of the equation that's breaking apart, Lord. Let us be a people that know that they'll reject even though one rose from the dead. They'll reject, but it won't stop us, Lord. It won't stop us so we just get comfortable. So I thank you, Lord, today. You've pricked our hearts. To he that had an ear to hear, Lord, you move us. You move us. So let us not be the same no more. Let us be a people of challenge, people of obedience, knowing that I'll challenge this old man within me not to rise up and say, I can't, because God is greater. I thank you, Lord, for empowering us now to do the will. You would never ask us to do it if you could. So, Lord, let us be a people of faith that follow you every day and do what you ask us to do. In Jesus' name, the saints said, Amen. Amen. Amen.